Okay, so we are in the book of Revelation, and we started covering chapter 17 in the book of Revelation, which is lesson number 10, I believe, um, page number 75. So we started covering that. We looked at the harlot. We looked at Babylon. Um, the great, try to understand what it means, uh, something that is pretty clear um, that it doesn't seem like from the scriptures that it is referring to Rome, as many teachers would put out there that this Babylon is indeed uh, the city of Rome and the Roman Empire. Uh, there is no evidence that it is so, because if it was supposed to be Rome, then the Lord would not use the word Babylon. And Babylon at the time uh, when John was getting his visions around AD 80 or AD 90 was still a thriving city. Uh, there were a lot of people who lived in Babylon. There were a lot of Jews who lived in Babylon. And Babylon was still a major city in the Eastern world. So it is not that Babylon was gone and now Babylon was being pictured as Rome, but if the Lord meant Babylon, then there is something about it. So that is where we kind of looked at and what we were talking about a couple of weeks back was how this describes the false church. It describes everything that the true church is not. So... Babylon as a religion, Babylon as a worldwide religion represents everything that the true church is not, worshiping everything that the true church does not, holding on to the principles that the true church does not. So you would see through the scriptures, really, uh, especially in the book of Revelation, it's all about, I think we talked about it, I'm, I'm not going to delve too much into it. But it is always showing the true Savior uh, contrasted with the false one. And that is the whole battle in the book of Revelation, right? So that is what we covered in the first six verses of chapter 17. And then uh, verse 7 onwards, I want to kind of race through it because we talked quite a bit about this beast and the ten heads um, I think the homework that was given a couple of weeks back was to read a particular passage in the Old Testament. Does anybody remember that? No? Okay. We were talking about Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 2, we have a vision that uh, Nebuchadnezzar has. And in Nebuchadnezzar's vision, he sees, um, let me just jump down to the particular uh, verse, um, in chapter 2 and verse 31 onwards, and this is a dream that Nebuchadnezzar the king had, and he was disturbed, and he called all his soothsayers, and nobody was able to describe to him what this vision was until Daniel uh, was brought in, and he was uh, able to tell him what the dream was and also interpret the dream. So here in verse 31 of chapter 2, he says, You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, this great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, bronze the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So... Speaking of this vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, seeing this big uh, being, so to say, and in this, on this being, 
there are all these parts of the human body being described and they're made out of different material. And what um, Daniel is referring to here uh, really is the head that was of gold representing the Babylonian Empire. And then we have the chest and arms of silver, which is the Medo-Persian Empire. The belly and thighs of bronze representing the Greeks, and then the legs of iron representing the Roman Empire. So here you have the description of these various kingdoms that came, and they, for a brief period of time, held sway in the whole world, and they were managing the world. And then you have this feet of iron and clay, a pretty interesting observation. Our two feet combined have 10 toes, and that is what seems to be referring here of something that has not yet come, something that's going to come and will be crushed by the rock, by the real rock, and this rock is going to crush the feet, and along with it, it's going to take everything else and destroy. So that is where we are in the book of Revelation. If uh, I have a book that we are following. If somebody could just help our dear brother there with another book. Um, we have some books on the foyer table. Um, so looking at that particular image, we are able to understand that at the latter time, there is going to be this group. So we are in Revelation chapter 17. We are looking through this meaning of the ten kings, right? Revelation chapter 17, and we are looking at this beast. And let me focus on verse 8, okay? The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not and is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. It's pretty interesting when you look at it. There's, there's, there's a group of seven kings and an eighth, and then there's a group of ten kings, okay? These ten kings, they have received no kingdom as yet. So these are people who are going to come. There's, group, there's going to be this group of 10 kings who during the latter part of the seven year tribulation, they take all authority that they have and they hand it to this beast. And this beast now is their leader. They are enamored by this beast. These are the group of, we don't know who these 10 kings are. Now, you know, in the past, people have looked at the European Union and said, well, yeah, there is 10 kingdoms there, and those are the 10 kings. We don't know that. We don't know what group it's going to be, um, but there are going to be this group of 10 kings who give their power to this beast. And now we also see that there are seven kings, okay? Seven kings, and then there is an eighth king. And not only that, look at uh, verse 8. The beast that you saw was is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. And I think we talked about it briefly, is really it's very difficult for us to understand what this passage means because there are two ways of looking at this passage, right? The first, the, 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 the two ways of looking at this passage is because you have to kind of figure out what is the present tense of this event. What I mean by that is, John is getting this vision. So when the angel is talking about things that are happening, is he talking about AD 90 when 
John was getting this vision, or is he talking about the end of the tribulation period where John is in this narrative of this book of Revelation? Okay, does it make sense? And I, I see a lot of glazed eyes, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm hoping that I make sense here. So in order for us to understand this passage, we have to look at it in two ways. The first thing is we have to recognize if the angel says the beast was and is not and is yet to come, what is the present tense in which he's speaking? Is he speaking about the beast that was before AD 90 and is not in AD 90 and is going to come later on? Or is he talking about a beast that was, that is no longer there because it is the end of tribulation, the beast has been pushed down into the bottomless pit and is going to come out of the bottomless pit after the thousand year reign when he gathers up the nations for this final rebellion against the Lord and is then sent into perdition, sent into the lake of fire, right? Reading through the scriptures almost feels like the latter is more appropriate interpretation of this portion. Is the beast that was is no longer at the end of the tribulation period because the thousand year reign has been ushered in. He has been bound in the spit and will come out for a brief period of time when he gets to gather up the nations against Christ and his kicked out into the lake of fire afterwards, okay? Makes sense, there's two ways of looking at it and we don't know. We don't know and I don't want to be dogmatic about either one of them. I'm just presenting to you these two viewpoints. So when people say that the beast was, that they talk about the Roman empire that was and the beast is not, is the Roman empire is no longer there and the beast will come back is that the Roman Empire will come again. Now that is one interpretation that has been taught widely. But there is a little problem to that because in John's time, in AD 90, the Roman Empire was at its zenith of power. It was the strongest around that time in the whole history. So in John's time period, the Roman Empire was very much present. It was not it was not extinct at that time or dormant at that time. So that interpretation gives me a little bit of confusion to present. And that's why I wanted to present both of these interpretations to you so you can, you can go ahead and you can examine, be the variants, examine the scriptures and try to understand, okay? Make sense? Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, so now we come uh, in verse 13, uh, uh, 14 onwards, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with, those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Okay? And then look at verse 16. Then the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these, now ten horns are who? The ten kings. Okay? The ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. Who's the harlot? Everything that the true church is not, the world religion, the world empire of this, this whole thought process, this whole religion, everything that is against Christ, okay? You have the anti-Christ, you also have the anti-church. And this group, this whole faith system that is against Christ somehow is going to be persecuted by these ten kings. It's very interesting. See... The whole scripture deals with what happens to evil people. See, there is something very unique about evil people, is they have a tendency to self-destruct. So if you look at the Psalms, right? Many of the Psalmists wondered, why do the wicked prosper, right? And then they look at those wicked and they look at the Lord and they say, well, the Lord has put them on slippery slope that they're going to slip and they're going to fall, right? If you look at the history of Israel, there were many wars, right? And in many of these wars, um, for example, during Jehoshaphat's time, he was surrounded uh, by the Assyrian Empire and, and he, he had nowhere to go. Uh, 
and, and he looked up to the Lord, right? Not the Assyrians, I'm sorry, the Moabites and the Edomites. And the Lord brought confusion on the people, and they killed each other. You know, there are multitudes of stories in the Old Testament where the enemies of Israel ended up killing each other, right? The, the Lord would sow confusion. So anything, like the Tower of Babel, what happened there? Right? The Lord changed their language, and then what happened? They were confused. They were confused, and they, they, they couldn't get together anymore. They separated out. That is the end of everything that is evil. So evil has a tendency to self-destruct, and this is really how the Lord will work. And you will see how these ten kings will end up fighting against the very thing that they are sitting that that is sitting on them that they are based out of right so they tend to self destruct then we come to chapter 18 and you see the fall of babylon the great through the whole chapter 18 you are looking at the world mourning the destruction of babylon now it there is a little conundrum there is because who is Babylon, right? We talk about Babylon. We talk about Babylon being the harlot. We talk about Babylon being this uh, world religion that is anti-church. But when you look at chapter 18, you will recognize or we will understand that Babylon is also a place, that it is a particular location because there is a very physical destruction of a city. Can it be the city of Babylon? Would Babylon be rebuilt? I want to just show a video real quick, not because I am going to say that Babylon will be rebuilt, because we don't know that, but I want all of us to at least know the ground reality, because what, what I think is happening also is in a lot of places, Stephen, do you mind uh, logging in? Um, in a lot of places, people are putting out false information. Okay, people are talking about what's happening in Iraq and things like that. So what I want to present to you is an actual video of World Monuments Fund. This is a government or international fund that they are restoring the city of Babylon. Okay, let's not read too much into it. That doesn't mean we get all excited and talk about how Babylon's going to be rebuilt. No, they are rebuilding. That's why I want to show it so we know exactly what's happening in Babylon today, okay? Babylon has captured the imagination of artists, poets, writers, and adventurous travelers for centuries, if not millennia. From Alexander the Great to the archaeologist Robert Caldaway, soldiers and scholars have sought Babylon in their quest for glory, benefiting from the wisdom and power that were once centered at this ancient city. Babylon is depicted in Renaissance paintings and 19th century images created by travelers on their grand tour. Its legacy has been the inspiration for mystery novels and popular film. Most importantly, Babylon has never ceased to fascinate students of ancient history and archaeology. Since 2009, personnel from the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage and World Monuments Fund have been working together to assure Babylon receives the conservation attention it needs. The first step in the process was carefully documenting the current conditions at the site. Several new technologies were used to advance the process, including digital photography, laser scanning, and GIS readings to find the exact locations of Babylon's structures, allowing us to create accurate maps of the ancient ruins and the boundaries of the site. Laser scanning provided high-resolution images that helped State Board personnel more accurately understand the conditions of the existing areas and to create the conservation plans that are now being carried out. The images from the laser scans also allow the beauty of the famous relief sculptures in the brickwork at Babylon to be seen by many people who may never have a chance to visit Iraq, but want to learn about the wonders of Mesopotamia. In 2011, much of the work is focused on preparing Babylon for conservation work. Local personnel have cleaned the site of the debris and vegetation that had marred the landscape, and also posed a threat to the fragile archaeological ruins. 
Understanding how people visit the site is an important part of protecting it, while also improving the visitor experience. Many people visit Babylon today not only to see the archaeological zone, but also to walk along the banks of the Euphrates and enjoy the views. As work continues in the coming years, World Monuments Fund and the Iraq State Board of Antiquities and Heritage will complete a site management plan for Babylon that will guide planning for future archaeological, educational, and interpretive programs at this magnificent historic site. No, it's an international organization. I don't know. It's it, it's funded by many. Well, if you saw the credits at the end, the U.S. State Department is one of the donors to the World's Monuments Fund. But that doesn't mean anything. Let's not read too much into it. And there is a system which the system is anti-God, and I call the system is developing. And when you mentioned about this, you saw that there is a, a political Babylon and there is a religious Babylon. The, the whole world is going to have one unique religious system, and and it is against Jehovah, the true God, true God. And the main characteristic is an idol worship. If you remember in the previous chapters, we saw that the, the, the people, the whole nation, your country will be raptured, is going to worship idol. And that is the characteristic of an antichrist who will say that, okay, that is a real God you are to worship. And, and so it's going to happen. What drew my attention is, you said that the U.S. <coughs> is developing into that religious system. And uh, uh, you know that uh, the NASA is developing a system to study the solar, you know, whatever NASA is doing. And they <laughs> no, it, it, it is true. There is, um, you know, signs that's happening. There are things that are happening in this world, right? Like Brother Tampi said, there is a religious system and there is a political system, right? Uh, it, we don't know how that's going to look. We don't need to, uh, you know, get curious about it too much, but we know it's going to be uh, something very weird. Um, 
It's, it's going to be very interesting. So the, the idea for me to show you this is, given the fact that there are a lot of well-meaning uh, brethren who talk about, well, Babylon as a city is going to be rebuilt. Uh, some who talk about Rome, the city of Rome is the Babylon that's being talked about in chapter 18. We don't know that, okay? Is the city of Babylon going to be built or is that talking about a political system as dear brother was saying? Is that going to be a political system, something that controls the world? At the end of the day, it is going to be something that controls the world. It is going to be something that the whole world will be forced to follow, right? And an antichrist who is going to force the world to worship his image, the, the image that he sets up in the temple, desecrating the temple, forcing the world to follow that. At the same time, there is going to be a political system, a world system that everybody is going to be forced to follow. We are seeing the signs of that. I think very early in our study in the book of Revelation, as we were uh, looking at what's happening in the world today, right, with whatever happened during the pandemic, I think I, I remember the comment that I made. I said, the world is learning how to mobilize, right? Look at how the governments in, this, in, in the world, every single world government has been finding interesting ways of controlling their population, right? That is what has happened in the world today. They are learning how to mobilize, how to get together. Now you have to take whatever we saw in the last two years and you have to multiply that thousand times to really understand what's going to happen when Satan is down here wielding his whole power, controlling the earth. That is how difficult it is going to be as, as life on earth, right? Okay, so in chapter 18, we have that. And then in chapter 18, you have how the Lord destroys in, um, in chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Babylon in the scriptures have, has always been the picture of everything that, that the Lord does not want. Okay? Go to the book of Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah, and we'll jump to... Chapter 51 of the book of Jeremiah. And here is the prophecy of Jeremiah against Babylon. Now remember, Jeremiah was writing his prophecy while he was, um, if, you, if you just jump to chapter 51, the latter part of chapter 51, verse 59 onwards, as I'm speaking, if you just look through that, you will recognize the time period during which Jeremiah wrote this message that we are about to read. Okay, he wrote it while Zechariah, uh, Zedekiah, sorry, the last king of Judah was reigning, and this was particularly in the fourth book, uh, fourth year of Zedekiah and his reign. Okay, so Zedekiah reigned for 11 years, so this is about seven years before the final captivity happened. Um, Babylon was the world power. Nebuchadnezzar picked up Zedekiah. He was a vassal of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and had to make himself uh, present at the presence of um, Nebuchadnezzar to offer uh, the stuff that they had to offer every year. Okay, So here, that is the time and that is a context in which um, Jeremiah is writing this prophecy. At this moment... Babylon is the greatest city in the world. It is the center of the world. And look at chapter 51, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in Lep Kamai, a destroying wind, and I will send winnowers to Babylon, who shall winnow her and empty her land. A lot of these things in chapter 51 was literally fulfilled with the Medo-Persians. They raised the city down. They destroyed the city, okay? 
So don't read too much into it, but a lot of these things have already happened. But look at um, verse 7. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. Babylon has suddenly fallen and has been destroyed. Wail for her, take balm for her pain, perhaps she may be healed. So here you have these pictures of the destruction of Babylon. But here, even though the Lord is specifically uh, referring to the city of Babylon, but included in it is the system of Babylon is the whole thing that talks about what the Lord does not want. Everything that stands against the Lord and his nation, the nation of Israel. Does that make sense? So that is what we are seeing here. So we have to kind of connect what the theme of Babylon is in the scriptures with what we read in Revelation 18 and 19. So to summarize, like... Brother Thampi said, there are two aspects of Babylon, the religious aspect and then the political aspect. The religious aspect we talked about is everything that the church is not. It's everything that the church does not believe in, the true church does not believe in. It's everything that the true church does not worship. It is false worship, false idols, everything. But political system is everything that is a system that the Lord does not want. It is the system that the Lord does not, we talked about uh, the ways in which the, um, the, uh, the people have tried to reign themselves, right? We talked about various systems in the world. From the time of Babel onwards, the world has tried to govern itself without God involved. So that is what the political system represents. Whether there is going to be an actual city, we don't know. Whether it's going to be an actual land that represents Babylon, we don't know. What that city or land is going to be, we don't know. We can speculate at this moment. Some may say it is the city of Rome with the Roman church, the Catholic church, as being represented as being Babylon. Some may say, a lot of people claim it's the Islamic religion with its headquarters in Babylon that is going to be um, represented. I know there were a lot of authors in the 90s who got excited about Saddam Hussein rebuilding Babylon. Saddam Hussein is no longer there. So it's very difficult when we try to pin down a lot of these things, right? But could it be? I don't know. Whoever is rebuilding Babylon, we don't know what their intentions are. Is there going to be another city somewhere out there that's going to be rebuilt as the center of this political system? We don't know. Is there going to be another city that is already existing that is going to become the center of this world political system? We don't know. But we do know there is going to be a false political system that is against everything that is the Lord's system. So the book of Revelation is all about Lord and everything that is not of the Lord. And that is what we are going to see as we see this battle going forward. Okay, so that is where we are in chapter 18, and then in chapter 19, we see, uh, in chapter 18, you can see the people um, who mourn, and look at, I want to quickly look through what is going to happen in this world. So as the Lord destroys this political system, now we are at the end of tribulation, okay, so in the narrative of the book of Revelation, we are at the end part of tribulation. The tribulation is finished. The Lord has come to Mount Zion. If you remember, the nations gathered in front of Jerusalem to destroy Jerusalem. The Lord, the Lamb, comes down with his people. He destroys these armies. Everything is destructed. And he ushers in the millennium. Okay? This is that moment that these things are talking about. That is where the world political system gets destroyed and the Lord sets his system. Right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Lord sets a system. And here you can see now the world is mourning. What are they mourning? What is happening to the world? Look at uh, verse 11. Okay? Verse 11 of chapter 18. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her. Her meaning 
this political system that they have created, this Babylon that they have created, and what are they doing? Merchandise, because for no one will buy their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. This political system is not just the political system, it is also the commercial system. It is going to be a world which is going to be centered in every manner. Trade is going to be centralized. And with this destruction of this Babylon, all trades cease. And if you look through this list, you will find that it actually addresses every possible way the world trades today. From material things, services, all the way down to manpower. The world is going to lose everything. Every trade is going to be destroyed. Every way the world trades with each other is going to be destroyed. There is no longer going to be the possibility of, of ships going and transferring. I mean, the world is very interconnected. You know, I, I work in the oil industry, and, and I, 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 every day in my workplace, we, this is what we talk about these days, is what's happening in the world, how things move in the world, and we are in the business of moving things, pr producing things, and, and we are seeing today the first hand, I'm, I'm being awed at work every day as, as various reports come in, as we talk about what's happening to the commercial world today, how it's being disrupted, how people are unable to move things, how ships are being hampered, how, how flights have to change their path on the fly. The world is in confusion today. Now imagine, take all this that's happening today and, and, and magnify it a thousand times. That is what's going to happen at that moment. A complete destruction of all commercial activities on earth. That's what the Lord's going to do as he ushers in the millennium, as he ushers in his reign. He has to completely destroy all this. Everything that we see today, all the world trade that's happening today, everything's going to be destroyed. And the world, world will look to the Savior at that moment, coming in as king. And then uh, chapter 18 ends with the finality of the destruction of Babylon. There is no more joy. People are not going to... Um, be able to enjoy. All their joyous singing comes to an end because they see the real Savior. And then we will look into chapter 19 because I want to cover something very important next week as we look at the marriage supper of the Lamb. So next week we'll cover chapter 19 as we look at uh, the Lamb and His Bride and what happens, it's a very interesting topic. I, I, I love studying that, and, and we'll look more into it. Let's pray. Precious Lord, our Father, we thank you. We thank you for your kindness. Father, the scriptures really tell us that you are omnipotent. As in the scriptures, as we read in this 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, as the world sings in exultation, for the Lord God is omnipotent. And Father, that is what we are looking at. But Father, we as believers, we have such great hope that we are going to be with you. We don't have to go anywhere. And Father, we thank you. We praise you for this great hope that we have. Come at ourselves the rest of the morning, Father, our singing time, and later on, may your grace be with us Strengthen us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.